How are we doing? thought today we might uh, shake it up and do something a little bit differently. Um, up to this point, I know we've been diving really into the, the sociology of everything, which is good. You know, it's something that needs to be done. Um, but one of the things I want to look at now was eh, kind of trying to really provide some some application of these ideas. Um, small group dynamics um, and some of those kind of social psychology research things. A lot of, that's what a lot of my background and training is. And so how to talk to people, how to interview people, how to uh, motivate people, how to understand the nature of a group. And once you're able to do that, then you can kind of figure out okay, who's doing what, why are they doing it, how can we take the individuals and the group, blend them together, and put them on a path for individual and collect collective success while still understanding the diversity of these groups. And so I thought, you know, for those of you that are coaches or those of you that like the idea of learning about these things in, you know, using kind of the coach-athlete dynamic as a, I kind of as a case study, these are some of the things I thought we would talk about. One, okay, we are individuals. We have certain kind of inalienable rights if you kind of want to fall back on the U.S. Constitution. Um, but even though we are individuals, we're also very social. And we have this drive to be around other people. If you look at here in the United States, roughly 70% um, of the entire U.S. population lives in urban areas now. Okay, now you can make a lot of argument that well, urban areas provide a lot of things that you can't find in the rural areas, um, and that's true. You know, I grew up in rural areas my entire life in the middle of nowhere in these small little um, dusty towns, and that is true. There's there's not a lot of opportunity. There's not as much entertainment. All right, and what what's drawing people to the urban environment is this. A lot of it's the idea to be around other people, and that's not bad. That's kind of the basic starting point for what it is we're going to, in terms of trying to understand how and why we take these individuals, blend them in a group, and then lead them forward to achieve individual and collective success. So, what's a group? Uh, this is another wonderful definition that I'm providing you. Um, a collection of people. That's it. And, but there's usually some tie that binds. There's something that they have in common, be it a goal, be it some sort of attribute, some sort of belief, an ideology, something. All right. Now, once you know that we are social, we want to be around other people, we willingly and willfully jump into group situations. All right. Now, if you're a coach and you, you, you have this motley crew of individuals, and you have to understand how to mold them into not only individual players, but also individuals that come together and operate as one sort of collective unit, obviously if you're a coach of a team. Now, if you're a coach of an individual, uh, maybe tennis or, or golf or something like that, then obviously this lecture you're going to have to kind of step outside of your comfort zone and your experiences and just kind of think what it would be like to be a, cult, a coach in a, in a different type of social environment. These are the, <laughs> the, the the stages of how a group is going to develop. And every group, regardless of whether it's a jury, um, a sports team, or some sort of research and development unit in a uh, corporate hotel chain, whatever, all right, as groups are brought together, this is the process that they go through. One is the awkward forming and, and storming. So you got forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. You know, obviously this one, they, they ran out of the orming sound and you tried to kind of mash it in there. But the forming. Remember the first day when you went to a new school and you're just kind of assessing the lunchroom and where people sit or your classes? Similar process going on here. You know, especially if, you know, I remember in, uh, you know, my vaunted high school athletic career, um, it was back when, I, I don't know if they still do that, some schools now cut players, others don't. Uh, but they, they, in my schools, the, the, all the ones I attended, they, they cut players. All right? And so the very first day of tryouts, you went there and you were assessing, okay, who am I? I'd say, I think I, I think I can beat him. I'm better than him. Oh, I'm so not better than him. 
so on and so forth, right? And as you start assessing that situation, they make cuts, and now you've got these individuals that are left, you know, you're going to have people that don't necessarily agree on everything, and that's okay. You know, conflict, and more importantly, the resolution of that conflict, which is why this is called storming, you know, conflict, storms, eh, you know, that kind of thing. All right, once you start to work your way through that, and the coach is going to be integral in this process, you have adversity and you're trying to work your way through that, then cohesion or norms are going to develop for that group. Once you have that cohesion and that morale, then the performance aspect is going to increase dramatically. And people understand that you have now individual, but you also have common collective group goals. And then at the end of the season, they're going to disengage. All right, you're going to, they're going to go their separate ways. And next year, you're going to have the exact same process. And the coach has to be very familiar with this process of trying to find out, find out individuals, understand what strengths and weaknesses they have mentally, emotionally, athletically. Okay, and then as you're starting to put together, maybe this year you have a group of players that is not really their skill set collectively is not suited to the type of offense or defense that you want to run in whatever sport you're the coach of all right you have differences you're going to have to figure out what your identity is and that's kind of this storming and norming process figuring out how you as a coach are going to maximize the effort the motivation the performance of the individuals but more importantly of the entire unit Well, once you have, I mean, if coaches and managers and leaders, if they understand these essential properties that are so dynamic to the execution of, of relationships and processes within the group situation, then those individuals, obviously, they have information that they can then implement in whatever way that they deem necessary. And that's why we like to talk about these things is because what you're able to do then is take in once you identify some of these essential properties and we'll talk about mandated coaching education, you know, near the end of the semester, but the idea is that you have all this wonderful information out there that um are it can be very very impactful, influential and important for coaches. But they're not mandated to understand these things. So if they didn't have a coach um, that went out and sought out some of this more academically tinged information, they're probably not going to do that either. Now, remember I was telling you the story about um, working on the, the research grant for um, junior college softball here in the state of Kansas? Well, I, I met a couple of very, very interesting coaches, and one of them, um, she, was a, uh, she was a head coach of a particular team, and she had just completed her master's degree in psychology. And it was very important to her to apply a lot of the ideas that she discussed academically and wrote about in papers and research projects and give that to her team in a way that they could digest it, understand it, and then help move them forward. And I thought it was interesting because I, I, you know, I, I met this coach at the beginning of the season, and as the season progressed, you could tell that the team was getting better. You could tell that, and, and this is going to be obviously very, very important when you're talking about community college where you only have people for two years. So if you're a sophomore, you're sort of the upperclassmen, really, because you only have freshmen and sophomores. All right, and so trying to develop cohesion, getting individuals from all over the United States or all over the world to commit to a common goal and trying to find common ground from someone from a small town in Kansas to someone that was from an urban environment in upstate Michigan um, to someone that was from Canada or Mexico. You know, trying to get all these people together. And it was interesting because she had these sort of programs that she was doing. And you could tell that as people started to buy in, as the athletes bought into the program and what she was saying throughout the season, they got better and better. And a lot of that is, is kind of attributed to the increase. The cohesion is coming together and the commitment. And the morale is how everyone feels about that process. And you could see the morale of that particular group was increasing tournament after tournament 
individual play after individual play. And what it started to do is, you know, you have the cohesion that's going to increase the morale, and then that's going to start to set new norms or, or standards that are going to be associated with this particular team. Now, most of the time, these things are unwritten. These rules are unwritten, and, and they change season to season because the norms are going to be associated with the morale, which is associated with the cohesion of the group, which is associated with the individual players that make up those groups. This is why coaches have been hired to be business um, executives or, or um, motivational speakers because of the understanding, kind of motivation obviously, but the understanding of cohesion, morale, norms, and then the, the result of all that hopefully is in maximization of performance. Okay. Some other things, you know, as you're forming these groups, I, and I had, <laughs> I, I had a coach who was really big on explicit statements. And he didn't call it that, but we had contract. It was a, he was a baseball coach, and we had a contract that we had to help develop and then sign. And you had to go up there and pledge and all this kind of stuff. And the, and the irony of all this is that uh, we were terrible. Uh, we absolutely horrible. You know, we won t two games one year. It's terrible, all right? And the coach, you know, you'd start with these things and then kind of forget about it because one of the one of the formal expectations was mutual respect. And every season, it degenerated into coach yelling, spitting snot bubbles at one player, all of us, something like that. Okay? And so, and this is important, and I tell this story not just for the sort of ridiculous humor aspect, um, but also that, you know, when you have these things, just, just because you understand you took a seminar or a class and you understand that these things are important does not necessarily mean that your behavior recognizes the importance of these things. And, and that's the disconnect. You know, it, you need to take this information, this information that is out there on a PowerPoint slide, in a book, in a lecture, in a seminar, and you need to not just, okay, memorize, regurgitate, make my, my athletes do this, but realize why am I doing this? How is it that this is going to lead to some sort of, you know, norm or, or goal? Um, and so what you're trying to do is you're trying to set parameters. You're trying to, when you're trying to develop the group norms, you're trying to set parameters, expectations. Especially younger athletes need expectations of what is right, what is wrong. Not only within game, but also uh, kind of a code of conduct, behavior that is considered appropriate, that kind of thing. Um, carryover behaviors are these norms that are learned out in society, out in school, out in life, and then they're going to be highlighted in sports. Okay, the idea of sportsmanship is predicated basically on mutual respect. All right, and a carryover behavior that's going to be very important is the idea of authority. Parents, teachers, grandparents, um, governmental officials, uh, individuals that represent the law or polity. Um, you know, maybe some neighborhoods have older individuals that are kind of the matriarch or patriarch of that particular neighborhood and just kind of the de facto leader, all right? The coach in that relationship with, with authority is similar to the relationship to other authority figures outside of sports. And then you also have group structure. I mean, this, a lot of this depends on how and why the group came together. You know, is, is it something where you have one person in charge that's centralized power? Decentralized power is maybe the head coach and the assistant coaches are almost on the same decision-making level. Or team captains are very, very important to developing the group and developing... You know, you see this in professional sports a lot when they call a, a players-only meeting because it's a little bit more decentralized power source and the way that the structure is developed is that you have those veterans or those star players on those teams and they take a leadership role that's in addition to the head coach or the coaching staff. Okay, All those are going to be important. Now, you can't have a decentralized power structure if you have a group of a bunch of uh, young players, maybe rookies, that don't necessarily know what's going on. I mean, I mean, you can, obviously. You have to 
and kind of see how it goes throughout the season, but most likely you'll start more centralized. And then as the season progresses, perhaps you then develop or, or kind of fall into a more of a decentralized power structure. And that's the thing about all this is that I can't tell you what to do or how to do it, but I can give you all these different things and then you have to be, understand them enough that you can be flexible in situations. You know, because you know, the productivity of the group is not always going to be the same. You know, if you set really, really high goals, um, or if you set goals that are just flat out way too simple to achieve or don't make any sense, then, then you're most likely going to have low productivity. If, if you don't set any goals or you're very, very uh, amorphous or unclear about everything, you're going to have very low product productivity. You know, also realize what, ki what kind of social resources do you have available? You know, if you're a high school program and your budget is basically slim and nil, then being able to bring in these these speakers or these high-profile individuals, that's not going to make a whole lot of sense. You can't do it, therefore you can't plan on that. Um, so you, if you're trying to say, okay, group productivity, what's the goal for this group? Is it to win a national championship every year? I mean, you have to be realistic as well. Maybe you win your division, then you rent, win conference. And then maybe you get into a bowl game where you try to make it to the second round or you want to make it to sub-state or whatever, okay? You have to communicate those things to everyone in a clear way. And if you do that, then the amount of conflict usually is decreased because everyone knows going in what they're supposed to do. Now, it doesn't mean the conflict's not going to rise throughout the year or the season because it will. If it involves people, there's probably going to be conflict. So how you resolve that is also going to be important. Are you someone that brings in, let's say you have two players that are kind of bickering back and forth, an offensive player and a defensive player, and you bring them in, if we're talking about kind of a football scenario, and you bring them in and you let them say their piece and then you sort of mediate that? Or do you have this discussion in front of the larger group? Either way, I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other. It depends upon the individuals. It depends upon you as the coach what you're comfortable doing and that's going to be very important because if you're not extroverted and you're not someone who likes to get up there and teach and and talk a lot in front of um, large groups then trying to resolve a conflict within the team in front of the entire team is probably going to be pretty stressful for you and the chances of being um, successful in that are are greatly diminished there's this thing called uh, transformational leadership, and it's sort of the preferred form of leadership in intercollegiate athletics right now. And the idea is that you, as an administrator, a leader, a coach, your job is to convince people, and not, not convince, you're not manipulating them, but you're showing them that the, whatever is in their best interests is actually the result of the best interests for the group. What does that mean? Okay, let's say you average 17 points, 8 rebounds, and 3 steals a game. Okay? But your role needs to be changed. You need to average maybe closer to 10 points, uh, keep the rebounds, but also have some assists. And maybe what's best for the team is you not coming or being a starter, but coming off the bench and providing that energy after the first initial 5 or 6 minutes of the first half or the first quarter. All right? Getting that individual to realize that their individual statistics are going to probably suffer, but it's what's best for the team. What, what have you just taught that person? Altruism? The whole idea of, of giving up something for the greater good? A sense of cooperation? All right, so the values, lessons, and if you're able to kind of relate the individual role and the individual behavior to the collectivity and that groups are basically composed of people, single individuals. However, for group productivity, positive group behavior to occur, you have to get those individuals to function not as just the sum of the parts as individuals out there doing the best that they can. And think about this in basketball. You can't have a lot of people out there running one-on-ones and, and, and you're going to be successful. Um, think more about you have an offense, and that offense requires certain things of certain people. In some instances, my job is to set a screen, 
that's not there's not a lot of glory there it's not sexy or anything like that but that's what I need to do and so taking the individual blending it nicely with the group is going to be something very difficult because leading a group is not the same as leading a bunch of people and that's what transformational leadership is talking about is trying to develop those skills so that you recognize the individual who they are and that they're important to the success of whatever but the most important thing is not you as a person it's not me as a coach it's everyone doing their part so that the team quote unquote can start to move forward inevitably coaches need to watch out for some things that uh, some negative attributes things that go wrong in the group setting within a team the one is the social loafer and this is someone who's going to decrease effort um, what does that mean well it, it really depends maybe effort and practice isn't there or they take a play or two off during the game or you know one of the things that always um, I've spoken to a lot of coaches over the last you know five six seven eight years and they always talk about the, the star player that comes out of the game and then sits on the bench and does not support the team they notice that they don't want to see that just because you're not out there that you're not into the game and so the social loafer could be that person that um, doesn't necessarily give that effort and if if individual effort is not maximized then collective effort is going to suffer you have the social specialists these are members that you know those people that um, to show a lot of support for the other people years and years ago I believe it was University of Arizona their men's basketball team they were called the Gumbies I think and these were guys that uh, I mean let's let's not share code they never got into the game okay they they just never played and but they were sort of well known for the avid support of their team members like I mean these guys were waving towels they were on their knees beating on the court with their hands I mean these guys and, and it's kind of interesting is because by showing that effort for those individuals even though they never played I mean I don't think they ever got out of their warm-up suits okay they they gain notoriety for that and that's going to be something very important you know um, a, a star is not like a star athlete it actually it's a shortened version of sociometric star which is from network analysis is the person or the persons that kind of in the middle of everything in a good way okay information is sort of passed through them oftentimes it's a team captain if you want to think of it that way and, and the funny thing is a team captain doesn't have to be the the athletic or the physical star it doesn't have to be the oldest person um, Robert Griffin the third he was named team captain for the Washington Redskins during his rookie year because this was a guy that his peers said provided everything support motivation commitment to excellence accountability and he did that for himself as well and it's going to be interesting because coaches you I mean you you want to be the sociometric stars or the specialists but at some point you're an exogenous entity and you're a manager of these dynamics and a, a productive team or group environment these things are, are gonna kind of sort themselves out the under chosen are the people that are uncommitted um, they, they you talk about in you know, professional sports well he's a bad locker room guy or you know he's, he's kind of a cancer in the dugout that kind of thing someone who uh, Terrell Owens for better or for worse and we're not necessarily trying to denigrate him but he oftentimes he was sort of labeled as a malcontent and, and someone that was focused more on the individual stats and the personal gain not so much the group gain okay and, and again there's different ways of, of dealing with that but you're gonna need to as a coach understand who those individuals are some other things is that when you're talking about all these different behaviors um, and, and the orientation this again comes out of social psychology goal orientation is anything that kind of contributes to the accomplishment of whatever the goal is now groups tend to have multiple goals and there's different types of goals now this isn't a sports psych class so I'm not gonna berate you with all this information but um, you know if, if you're someone who is you set goals these are very, very difficult 
goals. Uh, throughout the season, you're going to have to adopt a maintenance orientation probably at some point because as the stress of a season wears on, regardless of the level, you're going to have people that get snippy with one another. And I've seen it in Little League all the way up to the professional ranks. And so being able to maintain the harmony, maintain the peace. And sometimes the good coach identifies that something's going on, is able to kind of tap someone or activate someone to help maintain the peace for the group. And that's something very kind of unique. Sometimes the coach is going to do it. Sometimes the coach's ideas and influence and reach, as it were, is processed through individuals on the team. And that's something that's kind of um, dependent on each coach and what's going on. The individual orientation is exactly like it sounds like. You know, Corn was talking about that these self-centered behaviors are not necessarily bad all the time. Okay, They talked about LeBron James being um, too team-oriented. And he would always pass the ball because he thought someone was open. And what they were saying is that, look, you're the star player. We want you taking shots X, Y, and Z in certain times. And one of the things you'll find is that the individual orientation oftentimes is associated with confidence, expectation. You know, uh, if you're a baseball manager or a softball manager and you, you give someone the opportunity, you don't tell them to, to swing or not swing, that they're just going to take a pitch, you leave that up to them. Well, that gives them confidence, and that's a very, very individualistic orientation. The kind of the the difficult part becomes how much of that do you integrate? You know, how, when do you give that? When do you pull back on it? And and that's what coaches or managers are kind of paid to do, as it were. What we're trying to kind of bring forth here is that sports and understanding people these team dynamics or group dynamics, it's, I mean, it is common sense to some extent, and it's, it's going from the gut, but not all the time. You know, coaches that understand and are trained in these methods can better teach concepts, be it individual or group concepts. They can better reach all the players in those um, sport environments, and for those people that want to blend sport and life lessons, they understand more readily how to do that, how to go about doing that. Because it's not always a commonsensical process, you know, of realizing that going out and hitting a tackling dummy a certain way, how does that lead to success in life? Okay. And individuals who understand kind of the the role of sport and as a coach what it is that they're supposed to do, blend it with this clear articulation and understanding of group dynamics. Not saying that you're going to be win a national championship every year, but statistically you have a better shot than probably those people that don't do this on a regular basis.